then we all begin. <laughs> Only English people will recognise us for that. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's start our next session, which is about the Turkish artist Nil Zialta. Um, and I would begin it just by a few words about conversation, ideas, and friendship. First of all, I'd like to say how incredibly delighted I was and privileged I felt to be invited um, to um, a previous session on black modernism by Sonia Boyce with Sue Locke and dear Sophie Orlando. And I've known them all at various different stages in a long biographical story I wrote elaborate upon, but also that I also knew artists like Balraj Khanna or Sally Marif, who exhibited in the other story uh, in London in the 1990s, and that both of them are exhibiting, uh, have exhibited or are exhibiting at this moment in London in 2017. Uh, I also feel that I have some legitimacy in introducing this session because I had a wonderful Turkish student, Charla Osbeck, who decided to work on Nils Yalta for her MA thesis at the Court of Not last year and is now pursuing um, her career as a young woman in a very difficult political situation in contemporary Turkey with Nils Yalta as a story behind her. But just before I go and I talk about the three people who are going to speak here, I'd like to just mention another young female curator, and that is Suzanne Paget, who in the 1970s, when she took over L'Arc, at the Musée de la Ville de Paris in 1971, put on an extraordinary program which was actually absolutely about the intersectional readings and crossovers we're talking about today. She was the first person to show, showcase both American conceptual art and the kind of art we're talking about, and especially uh, women's art, in the early 1970s. And I'd just like to say that in, and, and it relates back as well to the conversation we were having yesterday about Eastern Europeans, uh, Eastern European artists in terms of their origin and people of other origins. Because in 19, um, October 1973, Nils Yalta had her first exhibition at L'Arc. She had been preceded, just preceded, by Alina Shapoknikov, <coughs> who's only recently been rediscovered but who, from that arch history, I knew about before. Then there was art video confrontation, which showcased the video work, which was absolutely new. This was the first ever video art retrospective in France of conceptualists like Carl Andre and others. And then that was followed by Barbara Chase Ribou, the black um, uh, African female sculptress who was living in Paris. It has only just had a massive great <coughs> retrospective in Philadelphia. So I'd like to say that, uh, and that was before, just before, Joseph Kossuth. So I'd like to say, first of all, that it's very strange that the conversations and intersectionalities we're discussing today must surely have been commented on and um, discussed and formed all sorts of conversations and been very, very coexisting in Suzanne, Suzanne Paget's mind, among many others, in the Paris of 1973-74. Um, it also reminded me of something when I was um, struggling with uh, Deleuze's psychology of the cinema, where I found a little quote that said, well, what is the relationship between, between psychoanalysis and the cinema? And his response was very simple. We went from the cinema straight to psychoanalysis, and we came <coughs> back straight from psychoanalysis to the cinema. So although at the time of his performing that, and having that as a kind of intersectional thing in his brain, there was no psychoanalysis of the cinema, which perhaps he was going to write, there was this um, lived experience and lived conversation and lived proximity. And I think that's what we're talking about today. So we'll see how it focuses around Nils Yalta. And my three speakers are occasions for new friendships and new conversations. And I can't believe I've had my first conversation only now with our first speaker, Fabienne Dumont. Um, is Nils your, is, so we're having, is Nils Yorta's work compatible with black conceptualism by Fabienne? By Suma Sharma, the idea of India is um, a non-national narration on black conceptualism, looking at Nils Yalta and her friend Judy Bloom Reddy, and Laura Castanini, feminist or conceptual, um, reality and the socio-political in Nils Yalta's temporary dwellings, and Women at Home, Women at Work, a piece of 1981. So first of all, I'll introduce Fabienne, and then I'll uh, sit down and introduce the next two speakers 
um, uh, one by one. I think you'll retain that a little bit better. So uh, wonderful Fabienne, whom I've only just met, which is mad, um, is an art historian, art critic, and professor at the European School of Fine Arts, which, what's that called, the École des Beaux-Arts Européennes? Europe, yes. Vive l'Europe, in Brittany. She's the author of <laughs> Des Sorcières comme les autres, Artistes et Féministes dans la France des années 70. So this is Witches Like Others, but Sorcière was actually the title of the feminist periodical in 1970s France, Artists and Feminists in 1970s France, based on her PhD. She's the editor of an anthology of feminist texts published in French for the first time, called La Rébellion du Deuxième Siècle, The Rebellion of the Second Sex, Simone de Beauvoir's title for women, of course, um, art history um, um, facing the kind of firing squad of Anglo-American theory, 1970 to 2000, face au crible des théories de anglo and co-director of an anthology called uh, History of Art is Not um, Something Given, Contemporary Art and Postcoloniality in France, 2016, another book I should already have read, always already, and something more um, um, Breton, if you like, All to the West, Female Workers in Brittany and Elsewhere, Presse de Rio, 2017. And so, of course, she's written lots of articles which you can find um, here um, um, on her um, Archive de la Critique d'Art website. Uh, and uh, so let's begin. And what does this say here? And she's currently using her Nils Yalta research for a monograph called um, The Confluence of Migrant, Feminist and Workers' Memory, Nils Yalta. Nils Yalta, La Confluence des Mémoires et Migrantes Féministes et du Monde Ouvrier. Thank you very much, Fabienne Dumont. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Sumesh Sharma. Um, uh, when I met him a few moments ago, he was very, very modest. And of course, I don't see that as he co-founded the Clark House in Bombay, you should be at all uh, modest, but he was explaining to me his uh, relationship with Nils Yalta that he's going to um, relate to us. He's an artist, curator, and writer, of course, uh, and his practice is informed by alternate art histories that often include cultural perspectives, informed by socio-economics and politics, francophone immigrant culture, vernacular equivalents of modernism, black consciousness, but, oh, sorry, black consciousness movements in culture are your special areas of interest. Um, I think this way in which France is very bizarrely coming into our arena and con uh, co coinciding with our <coughs> kind of enlarged School of Paris idea is very interesting. And so we're going to learn more now about Nils Yalta, including more practice that she made in Paris. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. That was a very generous... Uh introduction. Uh, I, I sometimes like uh, representing France. <laughs> somehow, somewhat of a representation of France. Uh, uh, you know, my presentation is going to be about a bit of a speculation, a speculation to many of the erudite uh, uh, presentations that we have had since yesterday. Um, and somewhat there have been responses that have been conversations that have been happening from before. Uh, yesterday, Charles talked about Van Abbey Museum's uh, interest in demodernizing. And demodernizing is something that is of a sort of a passion for me. Um, uh, today, we had many kind of speculative conversations on the definition of conceptualism and black modernism, and also the idea of being black or not. And um, for me, uh, a few years ago, I met the, uh, the Pakistani artist and uh, and uh, theorist uh, Iftikhar Dadi, and he actually turned my attention towards the idea of translation, because at present we are, we are dealing with the emotion of modernism, uh, with its etymology in Latin, uh, in, uh, with, with its etymology in Latin, its origins in Latin. But when you translate it into Urdu, and my Urdu is uh, is 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 like my French, I can speak it, but most of the times I don't know the words. I don't understand the exact meaning of the words that I'm speaking. Uh, and in Urdu, there are two ways of defining modernism. One is a tarakki pasand, which means progressive thought, 
and the other, which is a tajridi pasand, which is a, the, 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 uh, the modernism of form in many senses. But when I think of translation of conceptualism into, um, into various Indian languages, various languages, uh, uh, you have, uh, you can translate into Rachunatma, which, which deals with the mind, you know, of uh, where conceptualism in its kind of etymology also mm -hmm. finds itself there. Uh, we also have to question uh, timelines. We have to question the question of authorship from uh, the perspectives of gender and uh, where the artist comes from, you know, the kind of social or class and caste factors that come within itself. Um, Hamad helped me with uh, deciphering uh, the age of Nelly Alta when she came to India. She was 16. Uh, in 1956, she was at the Robert College in Istanbul. Uh, a French mime artist called Theo Lusash came uh, through the college and she somehow eloped with him and came to Tehran in 1956. Uh, and then she came to Bombay in 57. And she traveled around India across 200 uh, villages uh, uh, doing mind performances. And as Nil claims, India was her art school. She's never had any kind of formal training as an artist. Uh, this is her in some kind of uh, small, uh, uh, you know, hippie. There were no hippies at that time, but uh, uh, some kind of small, uh, uh, you know, um, hotel room in um, in 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 uh, in, uh, in India. Where in India we don't know because she can't remember it. I don't know much about Theo Lusash because she has she has nothing to do with him. And all that I find on the internet is that he wrote a book on Japanese erotica, and I haven't really uh, read anything on uh, on J Japanese erotica, so I can't tell you more more about him. But this is a work by Judy Bloom uh, Reddy. Uh, Judy Bloom Reddy um, is, is, is an Austrian Jewish uh, artist who grew up in New York. Uh, her parents escaped the Holocaust and has been a long time collaborator and a very close friend of Neil. They're like best friends. Uh, in 73, they made uh, La Roquette, which was uh, a work that dealt with uh, collaborations with female prisoners in France. And then in 74, Paris Ville Lumière, which was a kind of a gossip column uh, that took the form of lists, which talked about the 20 districts of Paris. Uh, this is an extremely important uh, work by Judy Bloom. I can't, uh, I'm sorry it is in, it, it was in high definition, but somehow it doesn't represent itself well because there are too many pages. But what you see here is that she makes a list of all the train stations in India. Now, the idea of India itself is a conceptual idea in many senses. <laughs> my friends in Pakistan might entirely agree with me, and I have come to agree with them in many senses because uh, the, the gathering of this geography came from train stations, from uh, telegraph lines, and what Judy does is, uh, when she comes to India in the 60s, she begins noting all the train heads. Because before the British came and you know, uh, created this conglomeration of diverse cultures, languages, and races, uh, there wasn't an India uh, that you know, saw itself in kind of homogene homogeneity uh, with other places. Uh, presently, our fascist government, like, uh, uh, like in uh, Nil's home, uh, Turkey, is trying to keep, create a homogeneous Indian culture, which then involves the murders, rapes, and many other activities alongside to kind of eradicate any kind of diversity that we have. But what's important is that a lot of Judy Bloom's practice comes from making lists. So she makes the lists of, uh, uh, of, of all the uh, uh, names of rivers in India. Now, in India, the uh, idea of an extremely patriarchal, misogynist society, we do give women uh, the role of goddesses, and we do give, or we name all our rivers, um, uh, after women, but what we also do is that we pollute those rivers. Most of the rivers are violently destroyed today, including the Ganges. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 Judy uses a kind of ledger sheet that then uh, that then uh, becomes uh, uh, this kind of uh, you know where she counts all these names. This kind of uh, extreme. You know, the names when you translate them, and, and translation is important here because. When she, uh, when you translate them, they they are extremely, um, they eulogizing the liver, uh, river. You know, they're very really beautiful names, etc. But that beauty disappears when you actually encounter the river. You can't even drink from most of the present rivers that we have in India. And there's a huge nationalist 
you know, effort right now to clean these rivers up because they, they represent our civilization. And why I talk of rivers and why I included that image was because uh, the problem with India, and here I come to the question of blackness in many senses. Now, blackness is not something that, I'm not an academic, so I, I'm, so I don't, um, but, but what I feel is that blackness is not something that we can define or reflect upon a people who have self-asserted themselves this identity. Um, in India, and I don't come from them, so I don't speak for them, but I speak with them because they are my friends, they are my lovers, they are my family. Um, uh, there's, there's a large group of diverse people who, uh, uh, in the years of the nationalist movement, and particularly after the independence of India, decided to uh, associate themselves with a term called the Dalit. The Dalit means oppressed and scattered. Uh, these were the erstwhile untouchables of India, who not for 200 years, not for 300 years, not for 400 years, not for 1,000 years, but almost 2,500 years, were oppressed and exploited in the most cruel format of exploitation, where their touchability, their, 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 their ability of being just in contact with you was considered extremely annihilating for someone who came from an upper caste. Um, obviously, the, the colonial, uh, uh, you know, the colonial, uh, the colonial realm, alongside with Indians, decided to create a kind of mythical origin of Indian culture and its connections to Central Europe and Asia, an Indology that was entirely, um, you know, f spearheaded by largely German scholars, uh, created this entire myth of orig uh, ancestral North Indian origin, um, and. In India, in, in the years when Neil Yalta was actually uh, proposing uh, Paris Ville Lumière and all her other projects, in 1972 we had the Dalit Panther movement that, uh, that asserted itself uh, as, a black, uh, as a black consciousness movement in Bombay, contesting 30 years of India's uh, independence, contesting 25 years of India's independence, and uh, term themselves as a, as a black organization. And these aren't people in the margin in the sense of demographic margins. They are the absolute majority in India. And in recent years, they have also named themselves as the Bahujan, as the majority in many senses. Now, why would I suddenly speak of Neil Yalta and uh, Judy Bloom to define this movement presently there in India? This is kind of preposterous in many senses. Most Indian art historians will not even name Judy Bloom ready, even though she has been really important in actually supporting the careers of lots of Indian women, lots of Indian men as artists in Paris and in New York. Um, I propose it because there's an ancient Indian saying where women, uh, Dalits, and land should always be beneath your feet. You know, and, and, and so this kind of association and this kind of, uh, where, you know, the Dalit is somehow also free from morality and, you know, mere morality. And this is again Nil in, in India walking around, photographs as she did her mind, uh, mind, uh, mind, uh, mind uh, uh, performances. Uh, actually, you showed an amazing image of what was happening in Bombay with Exile is a Hard Job. Uh, we, in, in 2014, in collaboration with the Kadis Art Foundation, did an exhibition in Bombay called uh, "And You Get Killed," uh, uh, and and you get killed. Uh, no, uh, uh, and we lay traps for the troubadours who get killed before they reach Bombay. And it was about this idea of you know cross geographical connections. And uh, Nil was introduced to us two years before by by Judy Bloom Reddy. And Judy has been really important in my own practice of introducing me to Indian modernism, if there is something as Indian modernism, but to the artists who are now claimed or you know, associated with that movement. When we actually propose these unauthorized, um, unauthorized uh, um, um, you know, uh, posters around, around the city of uh, Bombay, um, we received a lot of support from the public. Actually, Exile is a Hard Job, this is a recent image and it still exists till today. So it was put in 2004, it has faded, but it still exists. And it has an extremely important, uh, extremely important uh, significance, because that tea stall is exactly opposite, uh, presently, the National Gallery of Modern Art, but the same place where uh, Theo and Neil actually performed in 1959, uh, uh, which was then, it was a town hall then, and now it's been converted into the Gallery of Modern Art. And Clark House and this tea stall is exactly opposite that space. So it somehow also maps this kind of years that comes through that. Uh, this was them in Tehran in 56 uh, performing. Um, 
this is an amazing, uh, another format of lists that actually Judith created when she was in India for a certain period of time, grappling with her partner Krishna Reddy, this kind of Indian bureaucracy. Now when you come to <coughs> India, we've learned really well from the British to create these kind of extra, uh, you know, extra mural, uh, you know, uh, uh, bureaucratic departments, like, you know, the Department of Women's Empowerment and Conceptual Art, or, you know, a pover Poverty Alleviation and Material Practice, or, you know, there are all these names, but they never translate into any great change. And so she creates this amazing list of... Uh, of, of, so you see this, you know, agriculture and cooperative, cooperation, administration and coordination, agricultural census division, you know, all of these names that don't really matter. Commissioner for departmental inquiries. There's a commissioner for <laughs> departmental inquiries. And so I, the National Zoological Park, the Working Girls Hostel. All of these are a part of a diary in a government uh, guest house in Delhi, so that once you come as a visitor to India, you might want to uh, speak to them. This is Judy Bloom with Zarina Hashmi, this, con this, uh, this conceptual art American artist who both Pakistan and India deny her existence because of a life that was led uh, of personal choices. This is a work by Judy's partner, Krishna Reddy, that they showed in 1960, that was made in 1968 when Judy forced Krishna to be a part of the Paris protests of 1968 May. And this is Judy and uh, Nelly Alta in Vienna for their opening of Paris Ville Lumiere. Um, these are the kinds of practices where Judy Bloom herself was entirely ostracized for having married a man 20 years her senior and also someone who was not Jewish or was not white in many senses. And so her entire, uh, her entire associations came with Krishna's work colleagues. Krishna Reddy, um, who was having a great deal of difficulties in the France of the 70s, decided to migrate to New York, to Judy's hometown, and he began um, he began the uh, printmaking studio at the School of Visual Arts in New York, and Judy began working to archive the uh, the archive the uh, uh, talks and interviews with uh, uh, that Camille Billops did as a part of the Afro American uh, uh, Visual Arts Archive in New York, and so she became the archivist working for Camille Billops. But that actually then turned into something where she would be <coughs> invited to Afro American art exhibitions, and thankfully she had like grizzly hair. And so she participated in many exhibitions with Adrian Piper, etc., and everything. And also, th this was mainly her practice in that sense, uh, not existing in any kind of mainstream American feminist or women arts or any kind of visual arts uh, exhibition practices. Right now, today, she has been invited to many exhibitions. Uh, her work, uh, Paris Villeneuve, has been uh, uh, has been acquisitioned by uh, Le Carnevalier in Paris, and it's going to be the opening uh, opening work for that exhibition. And Vraiment Feminism et Art, you know, was, uh, uh, you know, so these were the various kinds of, uh, um, you know, invitations that they had over the years. This is Krishna and, and, and Julie when they met. This is them in Paris. This is with other Indian artists in the 70s in Paris, while, while Krishna was running the Atelier Dissert. This is Krishna Reddy with, uh, with, with, uh, with Zarina Hashmi. This is the Delhi phone book. This is them about a month ago. Uh, this, is the, uh, this, is the, this is them now. And this was our presentation at Clark House. What really helped us was this translation to Hindi and to Marathi. Now where you see here are the present people who run Clark House. I do not run Clark House, I started it, but it was started with many other people. One of them is uh, Prabhakar Pachpate. His first international exhibition happened here at the Van Abbey Museum. And there has been a great movement. These are people who are totally out of the, um, out of the context of Indian exhibition making. They were never allowed conceptual existence. They were, not allowed, they were not a part of modernism. They were not a part of contemporary art practices because they didn't speak English, because they came from rural backgrounds, because they came from a kind of caste consciousness that never allowed them to be a part of, that, uh, of this element. And for me, what was important is that the kind of friendship we've held with uh, Neil and Judy Bloom has been able to really uh, launch us into perspectives that has created connections outside our very immediate context, which is Bombay and Delhi. 
and that diversity has come where people have understood practices of, people, of someone like Neil Yalta. Each time we are in Paris, we drink about two or three bottles of wine in her studio, and she talks about her life and her time in India. And people then replicate these conversations into their practice, these young Indian artists. And they're replicated by questioning the very, uh, the very, uh, uh, the very arguments for the nation. Uh, about three days ago, I refused to uh, participate in this project. Uh, an Italian curator, along with other people of Clark House, did a project called Take in the City, where they went back doing uh, public art projects with protest posters, and it was extremely successful. Um, and, and, and for me, I, I refuse to be a part of this project because I come from privilege. The fact that I'm speaking to you in kind of you know, lucid English in some senses, I hope you'll understand my accent, um, is, it, 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 it denotes a certain privilege. And it's really important for me, even though I am invested and politically very interested in the idea of black consciousness, not to claim the space of being black in many senses, because it is like denying other people uh, a, 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 an existing experience, which is not only uh, a political ideology, which is not only something that they, uh, that they, uh, that they um, associate with or are in solidarity, but it's, it's a lived experience. And um, my biggest problem today is that when Indian or South Asian historians do not see the role of people like Judy Bloom Reddy or Nil Yalta in the narrative of our writing of our art histories, because this is an extra extremely failed art history which does not actually take into the connections that were built on emotions, on family, on friendships, on love life. And, and, and I guess uh, when we are looking at these intersectionalities that are more human, uh, it, it is then that we might be able to understand the complexities of that period and also counter the kind of narratives that are being forced down our throats today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'm so fascinated by what you were saying and agreeing with you that I have not got my page right to introduce our third person appropriately. So hold on just a little moment and do come up. Yes. So I will actually repeat your title from here, Laura Castagnini. And I just want to say one or two things about you, Laura, so we know you a little better before our conversations really begin. Um, where are we? So, yeah, so Laura is yet another brilliant young curator at Tate I haven't met yet. <laughs> they keep popping up. So your associate curator of modern contemporary British art at Tate, and your research focuses on British art from 40 to 80, as well as contemporary performances of feminist, queer, and decolonial histories. You were previously programme coordinator for Innova, that fantastic place I do know very well, I take my students to. You have an MA from Melbourne, where you uh, explored feminism and contemporary video and performance, and you've published lots and lots of articles in places like N Paradoxa, which we know, run by the wonderful Katie Deepwell, and other things. So, in fact, I will zip down this long introduction, um, but say that also you curated the survey exhibition Backflip, great title, Feminism and Humour in Contemporary Art, for some of our discussions, I think you'll agree, are also very humorless, as well as not <laughs> taking into account love and friendship and all those other things. And um, let's see one or two other really good ones, as if echoes from London, <laughs> West Base, Melbourne, and so forth. So you're going to expand our knowledge once again of Nils Yalta with feminist and or conceptual, reading the socio-political in Nils Yalta's temporary dwellings and women at work, women at home. Thank you very much, Laura. I, uh, unlike the previous two speakers, um, don't have a huge long relationship with Neil Yalta. Um, I've come to her work relatively recently. Uh, I also don't speak a word of French. <laughs> um, so I'm coming to this work very much as an outsider um, with the lessons that I've learned from black artists and modernism, which I've been very, very lucky to um, have uh, worked with and uh, helped in some projects in the last couple of years. I'm very, very grateful. Um, but also I came to the Black Art Artists and Modernism uh, project as an outsider coming from Australia, a very different sort of context. So that's not a disclaimer, it's just letting you know that this will be a more sort of speculative paper, uh, focusing on the sort of the work and the uh, representation. 
Um, so I'm going to begin with a quote by Nelly Alta, uh, which, in which she's speaking about this work which we've already heard about. She says, quote, when we showed it to feminist groups, not feminist artists, but feminist activists as a whole, they claimed it was too artistic and asked us why we didn't go inside the prison and hold a demonstration. When we tried to show it to art circles, they told me in 1974 that this wasn't a work of art, but rather a sociological work. They claimed it was a political piece. So in my talk today, I'm going to be focusing uh, on the socio-political approach of you know, Nili Alta's work, uh, the part that is deemed too artistic for politics and too political for art. And I'm going to do that by focusing on two works, but I'm also going to usher in a really, ex or I find a really exciting uh, moment of exchange between Lippard, which has been already alluded to, uh, with Nili Alta between 74 and 84. So this is Temporary Dwellings. It's a multi-part video installation dated 1974 to 1977. And like many of Yalt's works, it was acquired almost three decades after it was made. Um, I'm not going to get into the conditions of display, which I did have originally in my paper, but maybe we can talk about it later. Um, it comprises seven archival boards, board panels displayed alongside six moving image works that were made over a longer period from 1976 to 2015. And so you can see these boards, uh, there's some similarities to the, the boards that we were looking at earlier in Topak Air. Um, each, of the board, each, each of the seven boards is devoted to a different neighbourhood that is marked by a density of immigrant workers in Istanbul, Paris and New York. And the artist visited each of these sites, which in itself is quite a radical move for a woman artist in the 70s um, to be going up to these uh, specific sites across the world. Um, and so each, at the top of each board, uh, in French, it's stating the date and precise location of the visit. Uh, below this information are four more rows of information, alternating Polaroids uh, with objects that she's found at the site. Um, so, for example, here we've got chicken wire and rocks and rope, uh, which are kind of adhered to the board, uh, as well as, uh, in some cases, draw, uh, pencil drawings. Based in a, they're based in a basic grid structure, <coughs> and the interplay between text and image serves as evidence for Yalta's sociological study of each site. At the same time, the perspective is anything but factual, and we talked about this early in relation to the classification of, uh, uh, of non-Western bodies by Western means of classification. Um, she's sort of re re reacting against that. Um, the hand-drawn elements in particular I found really beautiful and nostalgic. The sort of, over here on the left, we're, it's not a great image, but there's a, a tap here that she's picked up from the image above. Um, in the middle, at the bottom, there's a rug that she's picked up from the Polaroid on the left. And in, on the right there, there's a the corner of the um, television screen that's being picked up. And I find that the, this interplay is really poetic and chimes beautifully. Um, but at the same time, I become very aware of her subjectivity and her scrutiny of the room. Um, she hones in on aspects that interest her, and there's a real sense of her um, individuality, I suppose, rendering them with tenderness and care. And so this method uh, lies in direct opposition to the supposed <coughs> neutrality of the pseudoscientific strategies she is using. Um, similarly, in the videos that are presented alongside the archival boards, the camera's gaze is sensual, even distracted. At times, it zooms in on a detail of the worker's body, wanders down their limbs while they're giving their testimony. While the archival boards mostly present the outside of the immigrant workers' houses and their neighbourhoods, the video shows us who lives inside. And so the circumstances of these people vary. They include te Turkish workers in Paris, Lyon and Ghent, as well as Portuguese workers in Paris, and a final scene, uh, film, sorry, a final <coughs> scene filmed in southeastern Turkey. Um, yet many workers report similar problems throughout the interviews, unsafe working conditions, cramped living quarters, and language difficulties. The workers speak, speak in French, Turkish, and Portuguese. However, they've been translated by the artist into English captions for exhibition. Uh, Neil Alter explained it to me as, quote, I don't like subtitles very much, so I have, if I have to do it, then I'll do it a different way. I translate only the important sentences, and sometimes they appear in different places. 
So you'll see with this uh, scene here, on the, on the left is uh, a woman speaking about her experience, and on the right, uh, the, the text escapes its more traditional caption position and wanders up the frame to the middle, um, which is a sort of method to heighten emotion uh, in this particular scene. Um, thinking about her use of language uh, and the translatability, I wanted to bring into the room Irene, um, his use of Urdu script, um, and sort of playing with, uh, playing with those ideas about words. Um, I'm going to do this a couple of times, <laughs> sort of bringing in the British, and we can maybe talk about it later. Um, and the decorative elements are another element of uh, Yalta's work, which often take the motif of the mirror or repetition. And I wonder if this is something we could think about as a queer aesthetic, something I'm still thinking about. Um, so, for example, in this video, she uh, creates a four-way split screen, uh, which abstracts the figure who's speaking. Um, and from what I understand, she actually uh, creates this split screen uh, through mirrors and through a cut and paste, literally cutting and pasting the film, and which I th find really fascinating and a pioneering use of video during this time. Um, there's also a non-representational sequence um, in what is otherwise a documentary-style group of films, which I found quite uh, mind-boggling and fascinating. Um, there's a hand who reaches down into the frame to pick up this apple with tassels um, and, and brings it away. Um, and at the same time, on the screen uh, is a woman who's finding that same object on the street and, and picking it up. Um, the mirror appears elsewhere in this film. Uh, here, speared by a shard of mirror or glass. Um, with the mirror, with the red apple, um, a familiar symbol of exile for Turkish people. So, to sort of summarise all of that, I suppose abstraction and symbology are not things that we would normally associate with objective ethnographic methods. So, I'll move on to women at work, women at home, which is a four part public artwork which recorded the daily experiences of 10 women who lived in a social housing project in the outskirts of La Rochelle in France, which we heard about earlier has been uh, elements of this have been collected by the Frac Lomé but I'm going to talk about the full project. Not all of it has been collected. Um, so in contrast to temporary dwellings, these testimonies were not placed in a gallery, but reimagined in four different ways that focus on the original participants as the primary audience. The work is for the subjects, it's not about them. And this is maybe something we can think about in terms of uh, the production of uh, identity politics. So the first two components uh, focus on the bus line that connected the housing estate to the city centre. Millie Alter has explained, quote, the passengers were all women, for, for if there was a car in the family, the husband was the one who used to drive it to work. So we came up with the idea of hanging up big signs at each bus stop that said, women at work, women at home. We put up smaller signs with the same slogan inside the buses. And so you'll see here, I've put an English translation for the non-Francophones like myself. Um, the large commercial billboard posters are presenting a chorus of women's voices, reflecting on their condition working both inside and outside the home. The texts are encircled by photographs of women working inside and outside the home. Um, so there's a woman operating factory machinery, another of a woman feeding a child. Um, and there's also hand-drawn representations of both of these different types of work, with the kitchen appliances on the left and the uh, hand tools on the right. At a time when many feminists were working to validate and politicise unpaid domestic labour, Yalta's equalising of childcare with factory work would have been considered a radically empowering image for the women of Rochelle. In this way, the poster functions, functioned as a consciousness-raising exercise. As Fabienne <coughs> has argued, it gave visibility to these women as well as a very rewarding sight of themselves. At the same time, sorry, in quote, at the same time, the posters were put out on the streets in a very public way, which politicised the image of the working women as a counterpoint to the sexualisation of women's bodies that was the normal sort of images that would be circulating in the media. Oh gosh, I'm really behind here. Sorry, these are some images of the posters, but I wanted to bring into the room also Ingrid Pollard, thinking about the way um, the black female body navigates public space. Um, but I'm going to move back to uh, New Yalta. The second element of women at work was the small advertising panels that were displayed in the bus, um, which the, the words are much more condensed in these, um, in these works. It's a very 
uh, sorry, sparse uh, visual style, which make it appear aligned with the sixth aesthetic of conceptual art. However, Yalta is keen to point out the work operated outside an art context. There is no label or explanation to designate the project as art as such, and the artist didn't mention anything of the sort when she uh, <coughs> pitched the idea to the bus company. So unlike temporary dwellings, the work wasn't displayed in immediately within a gallery context. For both the poster and the panels, the audience was specifically designated as the women whose lives they represent. So this is the work in Frank Lorraine's collection. Um, but the work that I also want to mention is the work that, wasn't, that isn't in the collection, um, this element, which is a series of portraits that uh, Nili Alta made with the 10 women from the housing estate. Um, they're circular self-portraits which whose form referenced the souvenir plates sold along the seashore of La Rochelle. The repetition of different materials, such as plastic flowers, coloured ribbon, or autumn leaves, to create patterns echoes the decorative elements of temporary dwellings. And Yalta's refusal to treat socio-political socio themes in a clinical way. Um, furthermore, Yalta gifted these works to the participants. Um, and so by doing so, she's... Uh, echoing the original function of the formal inspiration. Uh, the works become souvenirs for the women for the experience. And finally, there was a performance, and it was really interesting to hear about the mime work she was doing in India, because this is very much a mime sort of based performance, um, in which Yalta and Nicole Croisset reimagined and re-performed actions from the women's daily routines in front of large scale projections uh, onto two screens, that's what described, distracted. Um, the, four, the 40 minute silent performance was held exclusively for the women uh, in their housing complex, in a social space in their housing complex. Um, and the projected imagery included uh, photographs of the women at work, uh, some of which, oh, five minutes, okay, thank you. Um, some of which were used elsewhere in the project. For example, this uh, photograph of women typing reappeared in the bus. Um, it is displayed alongside both on-screen and live reenactments by the artist that remove the original image further and further from reality, suggesting the fantastical potential of women's labour. This approach, which suggests women's work as a medium for poetic <coughs> extraction, contrasts with the documentary approach taken by many British feminist projects exploring women's labour during this period. So interestingly, uh, Women at Work, a very similar title uh, and a very well-known project to many of us um, by Mary Kelly, Margaret Harrison and Kate Hunt. And the Hackney Flash is also the same title, Women at Work. Um, so the third part of my project now, of my talk now, which I'll condense, um, is the dialogue with British feminism, which uh, was stated by the American critic and curator Lucy Lippard. So I'd like to, to suggest that Lippard was interested in the aspects of the altar's practice that have been criticised as too artistic for politics and too political for art. She said, having watched so many politicised artists reach out only to fall by the wayside or back into acceptable modernism with leftist rhetoric, I have the most heartfelt respect for those artists with the courage to persist in this nobody's land between aesthetics, political activism, and populism. This quote was taken from the 1980 exhibition catalogue for Issue, uh, Social Strategy by Women's Artists at the ICA in London, which is a show curated by Lippard, which featured the work of Neil Yalta, alongside 20 mostly British and American political feminist artists. There was one other artist from Israel, but the bulk were um, American and British. And the work, according to Lippard, attempts to replace the illusion of neutral aesthetic freedom with social responsibility by focusing on specific issues. These artists were interested in social change, adopting activist techniques to distribute their messages. I'm just going to skip this whole thing. Um, this is the work that Yalta presented, uh, Rahim, Kurdish woman from Turkey, which narrates the true story of a woman who moved from her village to a shanty town on the outskirts of Istanbul. Some sort of close-ups, just so you can get a sense of her context within this show. This is an um, uh, installation image at the ICA. And she also contributed to the catalogue. However, the French text was never translated into English. Um, both contributions pose questions, which perhaps we can come back to in the Q&A, about the translatability, literally, 
of Yalta's, Yalta's work to a British context. Um, in the bit I just cut out, I talked about how um, Yalta and Lippard met and how uh, I would argue that uh, meeting Yalta had a very big influence on Lippard, particularly in the way she thought about conceptualism and feminism in an international context. But uh, for now, I'm going to also talk about uh, this experience in the way that it influenced Yalta. But I just want to clarify that I, I'm not in any way saying that this is a derivative, um, one-directional exchange. Um, so Yalta and uh, Chris Set, I'm pronouncing that really badly. Uh, how do you say? Was that? Sorry. <laughs> um, Travelled to London to install the work and stayed for the opening weekend conference. Uh, Yalta speaks fondly of this exhibition, saying that she really enjoyed meeting women artists in the UK, and thereafter she stayed in contact with many of the people, uh, many of the artists that she met, like Mary Kelly and Margaret Harrison. Many of the artists in issue um, were grappling with what Lippard called the taboos of art at the time, subject matter deemed unsuitable for art, like immigrant workers, labour and domesticity, and subverting ideas of high art by using craft techniques and making work for non-audiences. The show also included many portions of larger scale projects, like the one I'm showing you here. So I feel that Yalta was bolstered by this solidarity when she makes women at work, women at home, which is actually the next project she makes when she returns to Paris from London. Uh, in particular, I was struck by this formal similarity between a work by the half-Greek artist Maria Karas, which Yalta would have seen in the show, which is similarly a bus-based project in which uh, Karas interviewed 14 women of bicultural backgrounds living in Los Angeles and then reproduced them in poster form for exhibition on 1,000 Los Angeles city buses for six months. The posters were thereafter used as a multicultural teaching aid in Los Angeles public schools. So I guess the thing to think about here is the way that um, Karas is explicitly talking about this project as an art project, as an exhibition on buses that she then showed in the RCA immediately whereas Yalta um, didn't maybe, maybe didn't think about this work as, uh, an, in an art context in exactly the same way. Um, Lippard also seems to have noticed the connection of women at work, women at home, with the curatorial premise posed by Issue. Three years later, in 1984, when Lippard republished the Issue catalogue essay with new images in her book, Get the Message, A Decade of Art for Social Change, I was really struck that the image she selected for Yalta was indeed women at work, women at home, um, notably the more conceptual looking bus line poster. Um, and this strategy was something that she uh, did as part of updating images or something that she did uh, as part of her slide lecture methodology. But if we want to consider that Lippard actually had conceived issue as part of a touring show of transportable elements, it could possibly be argued that the new set of images functioned as another iteration of the exhibition, which included women at work. So, in conclusion, uh, in my abstract, I promise to take up the conference's challenge to articulate how Yalta's early work produces rather than simply represents identity politics. It's quite a big promise. Um, I'd like to suggest that this relates to the aspect of her work that is, quote, too political for art, too artistic for politics, or perhaps too feminist for conceptualism or too conceptual for feminism. Her production of identity politics lies within her refusal to focus on the facts when visualising testimony of the immigrant and, women's, immigrant and women workers with whom she works. Her camera wanders, her pencil creates poetic associations, and she creates personal bonds with her subjects. Secondly, it lies within her insistence on the decorative, seen in these two works in her abstraction of source material, whether through drawing, mirroring, reenactment, omission, or repetition, that occurs across the film, performance, and collage elements. To borrow the phrase again from Lippard, I'd like to think that this aspect of Yalta's work is in no way a negative, but in fact, uh, it blossoms in the space, in the nobody's land between aesthetics, political activism, and popularism. Thank you. With, without, um, what, what I'd like to begin with is this idea of engagement with people, um, political compassion, if you like, and um, participatory discourses, 
and how they relate to something we've had categorized here as by Schumann as an extremely failed art history. And what I think was a very gorgeous moment in your talk where you showed how she had come from um, a, a complex, both receiving and difficult milieu in Paris and discovered new artists, new friendships, but also a practice which she then doesn't, as it were, imitate, but takes up and runs with, if you like, by um, Maria Carras, Car which I didn't know about, which I think is an instance of what I call, if you like, if, I don't want to use these words like good and bad, but an extremely sensitive art history. And I'd also like to throw into this consideration uh, one of my little bet noirs, which I, uh, as you know, everyone, including people here, fetishize the exhibition Magicien de la Terre, and they never talk about Jean-Hubert Martin's sequel, which was called, rather, um, um, in a way that it wouldn't be called in England or America, I'm sure, Partage d'exotism, which, if you translate directly, is sharing exoticisms, tut tut, but it was actually about people who'd married people in other countries who were practicing from, surprisingly enough, Stockholm or Hervé de Rosa, going on extraordinary excursions all over the place. And um, it really refuted all the categories uh, of um, identity politics at their most um, um, rigid and inflexible and unloving, if you like. So I wondered um, if I could ask all of you, having worked all of you on Neil Yelter, what do you think about this question? I also think even the term art history, when you can say, well, we're artists, we're giving talks that we aren't art historians, so we don't have to deal with your boring categories. I think, I think that all of us are creative people, writing, thinking, or producing creatively. And so in this intersectional, intersectionalities debate, I'd like to <coughs> ask you about this kind of um, sensitivity, imagination, and compassion that new rewritings demand. Maybe we'll just go around like this and begin with you because you just spoke and you mentioned that lovely instance of sympathy. Um, sorry, is this working? Um, I suppose maybe uh, to sort of answer your question in a really roundabout way, I might touch on the aspect of the talk that I dropped, which was um, how they met, which I thought was really interesting. Um, in that uh, Millie Yalta went to a lecture by Lucy Lippard, and when she was in the audience, she was about 37 at this point, uh, and when she was in the audience, she heard Lucy Lippard speaking about this young, fantastic French artist who'd made this work called Topak Ev, and she was like, that's me. Um, <laughs> and so she went up and spoke to her afterwards. And then uh, they stayed in touch. And then when uh, Yalta was in New York in 1976, doing her residency at uh, ARI Gallery. Uh, her and Lippard hung out a lot, and Lippard then published the text from that work in uh, the first ever issue of Heresies. Um, so then when she came to curate uh, issue, she'd actually been in touch with her for about six years. Um, and I think that Lippard is someone who's very well known for creating uh, really long-lasting and collaborative relationships with artists. Um, what's also sort of interesting is that uh, in the very brief conversation I had with New Yalta on the phone, um, she said that after 1984, she, never, she didn't speak to Lippard again, they just lost touch, and um, she didn't see her again until whack in 2007. So there's something also about um, the way that people stay in touch and how friendships develop, um, what, are the, uh, what are the motivations for these relationships, um, and and how did they how did they influence each other? But also, how did they maybe you? And this is maybe a very um, harsh thing to say, but how, how did they maybe use each other, or what, to what ends were they were they working with each other? Fabien. Yes, I, I want to, to go in another uh, place with this kind of uh, sensitive uh, imagination, uh, uh, putting in, in, the, in, the, in the conversation some things she did uh, uh, every time when she uh, uh, did videos. She interviewed people through uh, communist uh, uh, associations or cultural associations who were from the far left. 
and she was engaged in this cultural communist movement in Turkey too, and she did it, and this was this kind of way she was going to the people, then when she asked people, she was in a, a kind of friendship or something that they have something in common, and she was not like an artist uh, with a, a huge, uh, 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 who, who maybe was known or something like that, she was just uh, doing something like a new, a new kind of things, and they accepted to do something that they have no idea of it. And for example, I show an image of uh, 1983 when uh, 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 people came for the first time in the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. And she asked the curator that she wanted that the people she uh, interviewed uh, uh, be, uh, uh, could be uh, uh, in the opening of the show. And the curator were very afraid of this because they said, oh, do you, do you know these immigrant people? They are coming in the museum, they are going to be to do part six, and then uh, <laughs> it was something that she 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 told me about this uh, with her. Uh, we are laughing about this, and and then they came and they were there and they talked with everybody, and it was something very different that happened. And I think this is the way she's working with people and with this kind of uh, 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 sensitive uh, uh, imagination and relations to the others. And she did the same with uh, with uh, workers, women workers too. Yeah, it's very interesting. Obviously, there's a long history of um, busing workers into art galleries. In com I mean, I'm very interested, as some people know, in communist history. And there are parallels to what to the project you showed. So obviously, a lot was going on at the time because, for example, Sheila Hicks, who's now Flavor of the Month in terms of kind of multicolored, cushiony things, she did a fantastic project in Montreuil, the communist suburb called the Festival du Fille, which was all to do with um, you know people wrapping up brown paper in the butchers and so I mean there was obviously a lot going on and a long a long histoire. I saw it said it said house of culture but I didn't quite get it. Was this a kind of Maison de la Culture attached to the to that community? So the communist art policy gave in, everyone a huge amount of glue. Do you mind in La Rochelle? Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yes. And this festival was made by the the, uh, <coughs> the companions, the companions, the, the man of of uh, director, uh, Joël Boudville. Uh -huh. He directed the part of uh, uh, links with uh, the artists because you have music, you have different kind of parts in this festival. And uh, 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 Joël Boudville is the director of the contemporary art part. And then of course they give uh, they gave money to the artist, and she said she wants uh, maybe do one year with Nicole Croiset and they uh, were doing this project in different uh, time in the years and then they have a, a, a long relationship with the people and with all these cultural and communist associations of workers and, and other people here. And could I just clarify, was Joel her partner? Do you mean he was the director of a huge cultural wing from Paris or actually in this place in... He, he, he was living in Paris, but they, they, they did uh, maybe two or three uh, festivals in La Rochelle oh, and he was the director of the contemporary art uh, at that time. Lovely, that's so interesting. And let's get back to you. And you, you, you actually uh, dared, I was going to say, Jose, you dared to use the phrase an extremely failed art history, which I, I go along with in your presentation because it escapes these boringly nationalist categories, and I've just had to write a review of a book called An Un-Australian Art History, to do with people who are sick to death of Australian identity politics and Australian art histories trying to do exactly the same kind of thing, talking about mobility, love, and so forth, even for, for white Australian art history. So can you talk about um, your own... Yeah. Because you spoke as well with personal passion, which I can quite understand in terms of your friendships you described. Actually, you know, identity politics is something that is very easily uh, charged upon people uh, who have politically engaged practices. And uh, when we talk about something such as, uh, uh, you know, black consciousness or black politics, and I was actually having a conversation with Rashid yesterday about this, uh, the idea of black for me is one of the most diverse uh, conglomerations of people. Um, when you go to Senegal, for example, there is no community that refers to itself in Bordeaux as being black. Um, the, the same thing in the sense of being Dalit, thus it has people from the south of India to the north, across religions, across cuisines, cultures, marriage lifestyles, uh, patriarchal, matriarchal, etc. and everything. And so when we try to narrow down these kind of movements of 
solidarity against exploitation, slavery, etc., and everything, into uh, you know, and try to like debase them through acquisitions of identity politics. It becomes extremely problematic for me, and uh, at this, especially after Trump, there's been a lot of accusation of identity politics upon you know various political movements such as this. And what makes me really, what, what I find Lily Alta extremely interesting in that context is because uh, in her own personal life, there's a great deal of diversity. You know, even as being Turkish. There's a great deal of conflict in the sense of why she is Turkish or not Turkish, or what, what you know. For example, in translation, actually English is her mother tongue, and I don't understand why uh, would that not have uh, been there. Uh, she speaks Turkish fluently, but also she speaks English, as anyone in Istanbul who had gone to an English-speaking school would have spoken English as their mother tongue. And so, so in many senses, she represents that diversity, and why I wanted to present her as an Indian artist in this, to then deny the idea of India, is by saying that you know, when she claims to have learned art in India, it again brings us back to that question, is that how many representations can she put forth you know, through her practice as a French artist, Turkish immigrant, feminist, conceptualist. When you look at her paintings, none of us have discussed her paintings, and I once asked her this question, that did she, and she, you know, when I asked her this question, she told me that most Indian male artists were extremely boring, uh, horrendous men, which I quite agree with her in many senses. But uh, what I what I remarked with her paintings that are sold in her galleries, for example, like the galleries that represent her, they have a real interesting connection to abstraction in Bombay from the 50s and 60s, a very strong aesthetical connection. And so if she uses people, I think sure she should use people. You know, like every day there are conversations between Judy, Nicole, and uh, Neil Dalto over phone calls where they say, oh, this curator from Tate came to meet me. What do I say to this person? They have these kind of back dealings. And I think so that's important, you know. And I think so women should utilize their power circles and all of that. You know? So like uh, men have been doing for centuries, you know. So. Let's say deploy. I don't have to say use. I'd like to throw this over to the floor because I'm sure there are lots and lots of people who want to participate. Because we've got from from a very diverse particular to the general. Are there any yes? Uh, thank you for that panel. Um, and a couple of you, I think, used uh, or deployed um, <laughs> the, the idea of translation. Um, and I think one of the things which is interesting is uh, because translations are so context specific. So, in terms of you know, who do you translate for? Um, and then also time, because if you're translating for the same type of people at a different time, those translations become charged. Um, you know, you, you have to kind of retranslate for whichever time it is. And, and I wonder, in your study of Niels Yalter or her, um, um, her movements and her collaborations with, with different artists, um, if, if you've come across uh, instances of translating the same thing differently or for different people. I, I just want to add a, a point uh, uh, that um, the translation, um, what she said is right for the, the way it is displayed in, uh, in uh, the Tate Modern. But uh, the, the original ones, when, when they are shown, for example, in France, you have something very interesting that she did. She put the first part in the original uh, 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 language of the people, uh, Turkish or uh, other languages. And after it, and then you have the people, she, the, she, the movie uh, shows the people's faces. And after it, you have something like uh, uh, what is outside of the, of the building or what is inside of kind of objects or the, the, how the, the, uh, the clothes are, and then, she translated the, 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 the words in French or in another language. Then you have something very long when you have something that maybe I, I, I do not understand Turk, Turkish, then something that I do not understand, but I have to hear this language mm -hmm. and have to hear the people sp speaking their language. And after which you have the translation and you have to look uh, outside and different kind of things. And I think this is a way uh, 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 through a way that she's doing something with this kind of uh, 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 putting people uh, uh, as a public in a way where the, the migrants are when they arrive in the, in the in a country, and I think 
this kind of uh, 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 the, the display at, in the Tetmolion is very different as what she was doing in the 70s and 80s that I really uh, like because you entered in something that has to do with the translation and that has to do with that putting you in a place that where you are not uh, normally uh, put. I think um, something that maybe I was alluding to um, with when I was speaking about uh, the untranslatability of the work at the ICA in London, I suppose I was thinking about um, the show being so British and so American. Um, there was some Afro-American, African-American artists, but there were no uh, Black British artists in that show. So I guess I was wondering, and I and I need to think about this and read more, but what if Neil Yalta was being asked to perform something as one of the few artists of color, uh, one of the few artists of color who's not British or American, what is she performing and, and, what, and what purpose is that serving? Um, so I suppose that's one thing. And also the aim of the show of Issue was very much about distributing the message. She talk, Lippard talks a lot about distributing messages to enact social change. So. If you want to distribute a message, it has to be understood. Um, so there's that, I suppose, about, particularly about that context. Um, but something I also came up against in my research was that not only did I not understand the text elements um, of the work, but I also didn't really, and I, it would be a whole new set of research to be able to understand the particular situation of migrants in the 1970s um, and the way that they are living in these very particular um, towns, and, uh, and uh, Fabienne has written about this beautifully, and so have other people, but, um, so there's a sort of translation of words, translation of time, but there's also translation of very specific political context, and I think, to go back to the ICA example, I'm not sure how many British people in the 70s would have understood the relationship between um, Kurdish people and their movement to Istanbul for specific reasons and what that would have meant. Plus, I couldn't read the text. So it's just kind of like, what, what's that work doing in that context? Can I say something? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in, in India, the example was a bit different, where we had to use four or five distinct scripts, which have no kind of mutual intelligibility with each other, and also for, you know six or seven languages, which use those scripts. And uh, what has happened is that most of these paintings that you saw, these, uh, these, uh, these installations, that, uh, these kind of uh, public monuments that you saw, uh, they still exist. And every year after the monsoon, we replace them because the shop owners or these people come to us and say that now it's faded or the colors have gone. And so we're, we're continuously putting this back onto the same space. And it still exists till today. And there's a real sense of uh, ownership because Bombay, the main politics is anti-immigration politics. And most of the people who have these uh, posters in their, in their spaces are immigrants into the city. And so translation for me is extremely important. It's not about speaking the language well, but being, being able to understand each other, especially with, uh, from the context I come from, where I just speak four or five languages. And I feel that Neil really understands that because she herself speaks four or five languages, none of them really well or perfectly in that sense. And, uh, yeah. So more from, yes. Um, my question is for Laura. I'd just love to learn more about that work by Ingrid Pollard that you showed briefly and how you're thinking the relationship with Neil Yalter. Um, great question. I know. Um, I was thinking, so do you know the work? Okay, so it's um, called Past, I'll get the image up. Uh, I'm not an expert in Ingrid Pollard, um, but I was really struck by this work when I saw it uh, at, in Nottingham. Um, and other people here will be able to speak much more eloquently about this work, but I'll give it a go. Um, so she's, uh, it's a work sort of about um, blackness in the English landscape and her lived experience of, uh, as a woman of colour, um, navigating that space. <coughs> Um, and what I thought was interesting, maybe in relation to Neil Yalta, was the way that she's um, maybe appropriating conceptual aesthetics by combining the text and image in this way, but also the text that she uses is very poetic and uh, 
really emotional, actually. Um, and she also hand tints the images as well. So this is, I, for me, there was, it, it's like really unformed, but I was interested in the way that she was thinking about, I mean, my original thought was about public, how do you politicize, what does the making public do that, that politicizes something? Um, but also there's some sort of formal similarities as well. Another question? Just. Yeah, I think it's more of a comment than a question, so I apologise. Um, but firstly, thanks for mentioning the Kurdish question because I think um, I mean, we're working with the Kurdish communities here at the moment, so we wouldn't want to forget the fact that possibly some of the languages that are being spoken are not Turkish but Kurdish in the films, and that the relationship, the the, the um, complexities of diversity in. in Turkey itself, uh, uh, as a former empire like uh, the United Kingdom, well, that's again an empire now, but um, a former empire, the Ottoman Empire, is something that I think is quite important to recognize in, in, in her work as well. Um, but my question was slightly different, and, and as I say, it's more of a comment. But what, I, what was striking me about, I mean, why Nil Yalta perhaps is so interesting at the moment, um, is, is, is perhaps because she embodies something which I think is, is, is very much um, a, 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 an awareness that, that might be becoming more and more significant. And, and the only way that I can describe it is in terms of, of the, the shift as Walter Mignolo talks about it between de decolonization and decoloniality. And I think he sees decolonization very much as a state project, which I think comes very much to what Simesh was talking about India and Indian art history. Um, that this construction of, um, of um, power being shifted in a way from um, the colonial um, uh, uh, control to um, control within the new states themselves and with a, with a, a national government was very much a top-down process you know, of decolonization being a shift of power. And there's a nice moment in the Indonesian struggles for independence where um, the first declaration of Indonesian independence just asks very simply for the transfer of power and other things from the Dutch authorities to <laughs> Indonesians. And power in a sense is the decolonization bit. You know, power was done, the government was changed, but it's the other things that we're sort of talking about now. And in those other things and what um, Mignola tries to talk about in terms of decoloniality is this idea of, a, of, a, of, of looking from the bottom up. And in that bottom-up process, then exactly these kind of complexities that you're talking about that might apply to Indian art uh, history are, are made invisible, or, or in the decolonization process, those complexities are made invisible. And I think it's really interesting now that those complexities start to emerge. And maybe one of the challenges to art history, if we think about the inadequacy of art history as a, top, as a, as a discipline in all sorts of ways, I think, but one of those inadequacies is, 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 being, is, is having um, simply gone with the flow of decolonization in terms of writing those nationalist art histories. And that now maybe, I wonder, I suppose, maybe my question is to what extent can art history be responsive to decoloniality in these processes? Can it, can it start to generalize? Or are we at the point where these particularities, or for instance, Nili Alta's own biography and, and the focus on that, becomes the way in which we can talk about decoloniality? Or can we get away from these categories, indeed like conceptualism? which feel to me to be very much belonging to a mindset which is the decolonization processes of the 1950s and 60s rather than the processes that we might be seeing and undergoing here. Big question. Uh, was there just Comment one more, on the question. or shall we, do you think, Nick, we've got to end now? This is a well, there was a person... I think well, in terms it? of questions, we should maybe leave them. Okay. Them, just because we're already half an hour over. If we're half an hour over, yes. I just wanted to say that in my introduction, I forgot to add to the list of friendships a very long relationship going back in time with Nick. And in my other thing, I forgot to say, and she's somebody who hasn't been mentioned in the context of Nils Yatta, that at that first exhibition in 1973, a film was made um, of the exhibition to be shown in conjunction with it in some way I don't know because I haven't seen the film by Misha... Uh, Misha Devan, in fact the wife of the artist Jean Devan, who is an artist, a Czech artist, whose work is very, very sadly, very fragmented. But she, but Nils was working with Misha Devan for that first exhibition. So there we are. Thank you, and it's time for lunch, and Nick will tell us what to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank so you to all the speakers. Very, very much. Thank you.